welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. This is episode 46. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. If you enjoy learning new <laughs> techniques in your knitting, then you're going to really enjoy today's show. We are featuring an interview with husband and wife team, Arnold Culliford Knitwear. Yeah, that's Jen and Jim, and they live in the UK, and they've got a thriving Ravelry group, which is centered around their course, A Year of Techniques. They're a very friendly and witty couple, and between them, they've got a ton of knowledge and experience on a lot of different aspects of the knitting profession. We also have an unusual guest for our Knitters of the World segment in this episode, and that's Elvira Woodruff, who is a, an award-winning children's author. But she's also a lifelong lover of the craft of knitting, and more recently, she applied her literary skills to her knitting, and she's come up with a very humorous book called To Knit or Not To Knit. <laughs> Yep. Star designer Jorge Locatelli is featuring in new releases. We're going to take you on a dramatic hike up Mount Snowden and Andrea will be speaking to us about shoulder shaping, but we're going to start with under construction and that's with you, Andrea. Yes, it's with me. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about my design by Caitlin Hunter, which is tenure. And last week we had a live event with our patrons with Caitlin and she very kindly corrected me on my pronunciation. I was saying Tegna and it's Tenya. It's Tenya because it's um, named after a place in Switzerland which is on the border of Italy and so it takes the Italian pronunciation. So G-N is Ny and not Gn, <laughs> Tegna. Good. Yeah. So now we all know. Now we know. Last episode I talked about my process of picking the correct size that I need based on the gauge that I wanted to knit it at because my gauge was different to the recommended gauge. And that process is relatively simple. What is trickier is to change the pattern or alter the pattern to fit my gauge when it comes to the shaping of the shoulders or changing a neckline. And you can see here's the picture of, of the design. It's a really lovely, elegant design, but it's got quite a low summary neckline and I want to make mine a higher neckline. And I'm doing that because I want to make mine into more of a winter garment. So basically, when you're going about changing or learning how to change or modify a pattern to either fit your body type or your style or whatever preference you want, one of the easiest things to do is to take an element of a pattern that you might have already knitted before and insert that or borrow it and insert it into your main garment. So. For instance, I'm wearing this jumper on purpose. It's a design by Kim Hargraves, who's a UK designer. She does fantastic design. She puts out a couple of collections every year. So if you don't know her, you can go and check her out. And there's two things that I particularly love about this design. Firstly, the neckline. It's high, but it's wide. I think it's a really nice shaping. Yep, it's very elegant. It is, yeah. I hope you can see it well. Secondly, she has these long sleeves with a tiny little frill detail on the bottom of it, and she's also put that frill on the, on the hem of the garment. So I'm going to take these two elements, the high neckline that's wide and the long sleeves with the frill, and insert it into Caitlin's design to make it more wintry. The reason why I want to make it more wintry is because I only ever wear a summer garment two to three months a year, but I will wear a warmer garment for about ten months of the year. Yep. So, so it's, it's a value proposition. Absolutely. That's, yeah. my, that's my reasoning. Unless you are an absolute whiz at um, Excel, for instance, you really need to get yourself some good old-fashioned graph paper and a pencil. Now, I'm not going to tell you the whole process of what I did because you'll go to sleep or you'll turn off, and we don't want that. But I can tell you the steps that you need to take. So typically... You need your graph paper so you can draw up a really detailed schematic. Now, a, typically a pattern schematic, and this is just a, a rough drawn picture from me of this design, the pattern will tell you all of the main measurements for the main body area. So it'll tell you the chest measurement, the width of the chest, the width of the hem if that alters, um, the, the length of the whole garment from shoulder to hem. It'll also probably tell you from the underarm, length to the hem, it'll probably tell you the width of the of the sleeves and if it's a long sleeve it'll tell you the length of the sleeve etc. But it's probably not going to tell you how deep this neckline curve is at the front and how deep it is at the back or for instance what the ratio is here, how long it takes to do this 
decreasing of the curve here but that's the kind of thing you do need to know if you're going to hack the pat pattern <laughs> also this is a drop shoulder design but it's it's got shaping on it so I need to know how deep that shaping goes so that kind of thing you have to figure out by carefully reading through the pattern and locating the stitch counts in those areas and the row counts in those areas. So sometimes you just simply have to read it through and add it up yourself. And then you have to convert the stitch counts, which is always going to give you the width, and the row counts, which is always going to give you the length, into centimetres or inches, depending on what side of the big pond you live on. So that's what you have to do first of all. Now, you need, so you do a detailed schematic of the pattern that you're working on, and then a detailed schematic of an element of a pattern that you might be borrowing and you're going to insert that. Now you can even do it with a garment that you've bought at a store but fits you really well. So say you've got a jumper that you think is, just looks great on you around the neck. Then get out your tape measure and measure every little thing that you can, all the lengths, all the widths, all around it and draw a schematic of that. And it's still fresh in the program, it's still the beginning of the episode, you're alive and awake, so I'm going to hit you with some maths. Here is a chart. Now, this chart is going to show you all of the maths equations that you need to write up a good schematic. And we will put this in a PDF um, file that you can print out, and you can get that from our Fruity Knitting website. But this is all you actually really need to do. All you need to know is this maths here. So you write the schematic up. Of your, of your main pattern and then you write the schematic up of the, the section that you're borrowing from somewhere else and using this math that you've got here and you're going to use whatever gauge you want to. This is the joy of it. You just simply get your gauge and you insert those numbers into this maths and it's going to tell you exactly and you insert, so you insert that little schematic into your main big schematic and you're basically rewriting that section of the pattern. But because you're, you've, you've drawn a schematic and you really know all your numbers and you know your gauge and you've done your maths, the chances of you stuffing up is pretty low. <laughs> so I've already done that. I've done that on my shoulder shaping here on the garment and I've done it for the neck. So I'm still working on the neck. The shoulders are shaped in this garment with short rows and I didn't have a lot of success with the wrap and turn method. I didn't like how it turned out to me. It was too messy. So I went ahead and tried the German short rows and I thought that was a lot neater. But while I was experimenting around, I thought I might as well film this to show you the differences so you can compare it. And then while I was at it, I thought I'll add in a few more reflections of my own on shoulder shaping. <laughs> so it's not really a tutorial that's coming up. It's more of a... A meditation. A meditation <laughs> on shoulder shaping. Pondering. My favourite way to do shaping on a shoulder is really not in vogue at the moment. I like to knit the garments in pieces, bottom up, cast off in steps to shape the slope of the shoulder and then use backstitch to join the shoulder seams together. Many knitters don't like casting off in steps because it's harder to get a clean seam when you use mattress stitch. But I think the trusty backstitch works really well and I want to show you some examples of how neat it can look. At the shoulder of this garment you've got three delicate cables on a reverse stocking stitch background and you can see very vaguely the stepped shaping here on the shoulder seam. But the seam itself and the stitches around the seam look really neat and even. So this garment's just got plain stocking stitch and you can see the steps where it's been cast off for the, for the shaping of the shoulder, but the seam itself and the stitches around on either side are very neat. This shoulder seam has got a large cable pattern on it and you can see that this side of the cable is longer than this side of the cable but all the stitches on either side of the seam are neat even though it's been cast off in steps. And finally here's a very lacy garment with stepped shaping on the shoulder seam and it is also back stitched and I think it looks pretty good so this old-fashioned technique has worked pretty well for me. So
So what is more in vogue at the moment is to shape shoulders with short rows and most of you know what short rows are and there's a ton of tutorials showing you how to do them so I'm not going to show you that now. But a basic description is you work extra rows across a portion of the stitches on the needles which lengthens the fabric in the area where the short rows are worked. So you would start here and you knit across your row and then you turn and you knit back but not the complete row, you stop a little bit before the end and you turn around and you knit back and next time you would stop even shorter and that's why it's called short rows. As you do that this part of the fabric is getting longer and longer and this part isn't but you've still got all of your stitches on the needle live. The most common way of doing short rows is to use the wrap and turn method and I use the wrap and turn method here on the back shoulders of this design but I'm really not very happy with how it looks. It looks like I've done a series of sloppy stitches or mistakes in my knitting. There you can see these little funny uneven holes all along there. So I decided to look up and teach myself the German short row technique. And just to compare it so you can see the difference, I use this technique on the front shoulder of the same design. And you can see some uneven stitches, but I think it's definitely neater and it's actually really simple to do. So it's actually very easy to turn any pattern that uses a regular wrap and turn short row into using German short rows. All you have to do is work one extra stitch before turning your work. So after you've turned your work, you put the yarn at the front and you slip the first stitch purlwise from the left hand needle to the right hand needle, so back again. You then tug on the yarn that's attached to the stitch and lift it up over the top of the needle, pulling the base of the stitch with it. And then because we're doing knit, we're on the knit side, you just continue to knit. So this stitch here, if you look at it, it should look as if it's got two strands to it over the needle and there's an in, and the two strands are interlocking on the top. So you always treat and count this as a single stitch even though it looks like a beginner mistake or a, a two-stranded stitch. So if I'm on the knit side, normally I would be wrapping and turning the next stitch but in your pattern you would just knit that normally and then you turn your work around and this time I have the pearl side facing me and the yarn is naturally at the front so I don't need to put it there and then I slip the first stitch pearlwise from the left hand needle onto the right hand needle I tug on the yarn that's attached to the stitch and lift it up over the needle and then because I'm going to continue and purl I put bring the yarn right around to the front of the work again and purl. That's how you do a German short row turn on the knit side and the purl side. Eventually your pattern will ask you to knit the complete row and pick up your wraps if you've done short row wraps and turns as you go along. If you've done German turns then what you will do is just simply knit the two bars or the two strands of the double stitch together as if it's one and it feels very similar to a knit two together. When you're working a purl side and you come up to your double stitch you purl those two together as if it's a purl two together. So this is what it looks like when you've done German short rows. You can't see any sloppy stitches or holes. I think it's a really nice neat finish. I naturally prefer doing the shaping of the shoulders by casting off steps and back stitching but you can't always do that and sometimes you need to use short rows in different parts of the garment. So I think a German short row technique is a really good alternative to use. <laughs> My name is Elvira Woodruff. I'm a children's book author living in Martins Creek, Pennsylvania, just below the Pocono Mountains in the United States. I write during the day, I knit every night, and I've been knitting for about 40 years. I've knit for my children, I've knit for their children, I've knit for family, for friends, and when I think about all the knitting that I've done, I realize that it really impacted my life. 
It's so interwoven in, into my life because I've always been knitting for people that I love. And so I decided that I wanted to write a knitting book. And it was the kind of book I thought that I hadn't seen a lot of. I wanted it to be more of a literary book. It's not a how-to book. It's not a pattern book. It's a book that explains what knitting uh, means to me and how it, it changes your life for the good and sometimes for the bad uh, if you go a little bonkers with your knitting. So I wanted it to be full of heart, but I also wanted it to have humor and have, have wit. And so I came up with the conceit of a Mrs. Wix. And I thought that the main character would be Mrs. Wix, and she is a knitting guru. And she, people write to her with their knitting problems as well as with their life problems, and she answers them. And when she answers them, she uses a quote from someone through history. And so let me just read to you the very first letter that I wrote for the book. Dear Mrs. Wix, my boyfriend says that my passion for knitting is stronger than my passion for him. I hate to admit this, but if we broke up, I think I could go on. But I can't even imagine my life without my knitting. Will I feel like this about all men in yarn? Sincerely, passionate for fiber in Florida. And Mrs. Wicks replies, Dear passionate, I suggest we turn to an expert in the passion department and see what Lord Byron has to say on the subject of love. And there's a picture of Lord Byron having a, a, a spot of tea. And his quote is, In her first passion, a woman loves her lover. In all others, all she loves is love. And Mrs. Wicks goes on to explain that that is very much like knitting. Because in your first passion as a knitter, that first project, you're so in love with it. But after that, you're so in love with all knitting. And it's not just the project. It's all knitting and it's all encompassing. And the... Um, the example that Mrs. Wicks uses comes from my life, of course, and fictionally comes from hers. And she talks about her tea cozy adventure. When my sister started drinking a lot of tea, she's a big tea drinker all of a sudden, I decided one Christmas that I would make her a tea cozy for Christmas present. And for those of you who don't know, a tea cozy is simply a little sweater for a teapot to keep it warm. Well, I made the tea cozy and I had so much fun making it. I kind of tweaked the pattern a little bit that I made it another one. The very next day I said, oh, I can't stop. I have to make another one. And I'm sure my sister will love two tea cozies. After the second tea cozy, I made a third and then I made a fourth. And then I really went bonkers as sometimes happens when a, a love for a pattern just overwhelms us. And I lost all reason. And I convinced myself that what my sister needed for Christmas was a different tea cozy for every day of the week. And so I actually am embarrassed to say I knit her seven tea cozies and wrapped them up in a box. I wish you could have been there to see what the look on her face when she opened that box and saw seven tea cozies. It was not the look of joy <laughs> that I was going for. Uh, she was so bewildered and slightly horrified uh, to find all these tea cozies. And those of you who have, have knit for family and friends, and when you've spent all this time and you've given them this hand knit uh, present, and you've gotten a less than tepid response back, not that joyful look that you were so hoping for, um, you'll be able to relate to that story. And so I did actually add the pattern for this tea cozy in the book. There are a few patterns sprinkled in here, but it's not a pattern book, as I said. The other knitting that I've done is I've talked about um, knitting for the elderly and caregiving. And because my parents were growing old, uh, I, my sister and I decided we were going to devote some time and just take care of them. It was really tricky, I have to tell you, for a creative person to leave your creative life and just do caregiving straight, you know, 24-hour caregiving. Um, it's nursing and it's cooking and it's cleaning. And, you know, I found myself so frustrated because I wanted to create during the day until I thought, I'll bring my knitting. And so every day I would go to their house, I would bring my knitting and different spots of the day I would take it out while my father was napping, while I had put their dinner in the oven, it was cooking, while I was at the doctor's office with my mother. Just little spots in the day, little bits of knitting here and there, so satisfying. So if you're a caregiver for the very young or the very old, think about incorporating some knitting into your life. It'll make a big difference for you as a creative person. But I would recommend do not try to attempt anything too complicated. Don't do a lot of lace work while you're there because your concentration is going to be broken up all day. I found what I, I was easy to do 
were simple things like fingerless gloves because they're you know they're pretty easy and they're very um, quick or even quicker wrist warmers now my mother was always cold uh, if you've been around old people you'll know they get cold very easily and if you can keep the pulse point warm it will raise the body temperature and so I made her these wrist warmers that the pattern is so easy it's just a garter stitch with a little lace around the top and it really kept her warm and toasty and she liked them so much she was wearing them every day I started making them in different yarn different colors and I was making so many wrist warmers that my friends actually asked me to start making them for them because they were working in offices some of them that were very cold now I'm no spring chicken myself and so if I'm in a restaurant that's air conditioned or a movie theater I get very chilly and cold and so I started making myself cuffs and cuffs are really satisfying to make they're really quick you can put a little bit of design work and I do have a pattern in the book for this one uh, that I, I developed came up with and I think they're kind of fashionable actually you can you know make them in something that would go with an outfit and instead of um, having to drag a sweater with you to a movie theater you just take your cuffs put them in your pocketbook and there you go all this knitting that I was doing um, was usually for someone that I loved in my life and I found that there's difficult times uh, that knitting sort of saved the day and one of those times was when my father was just about when I mean, it was in his final days and he was on dialysis and he had lost his sight and he was losing his hearing and he had really gone inward but when you take someone to dialysis you sit there with them all day and I just was dreading having to do that you know for hours sitting by him he wouldn't talk and just watching him and emotionally it's really hard to watch a parent uh, you know leave the world it really is and I did find that if I brought knitting and net and if I was knitting for him it made a difference and I, I, I chose a blue alpaca that I thought he might like to keep him warm and I knit a very wide scarf a very big scarf and I thought when the winter came he could wrap that around himself and and he would be warm and so just the act of, of making him something that would make him feel better helped me through that and helped me to stay by his side he never did get to wear the scarf he died weeks after I had completed it and it was still summer I put the scarf away it was too sad to look at it and then a few months went by and I got a call from my one son and he was so excited because he and his wife were expecting their first child and I thought oh yay baby knitting and so I went to my stash and I was looking through was trying to find some some yarn to make a little sweater for a newborn and I remember that scarf that I had made for my dad and I thought that would be the perfect yarn soft blue alpaca and so I ripped it out and with each row that I took out you know I was shedding some tears thinking of my dad but I was also thinking of that new life to come and that new baby and as I knit that uh, I felt myself my spirits lifting um, and I was thrilled when the baby was born the first time they came home from the hospital they, the kids stopped at our house and they brought the baby in and I was so touched because uh, my daughter-in-law had put on the little blue alpaca sweater and the little hat that I had made him and I thought my goodness it's like the cycle of life you know that garment was made from something first it was made for someone who was leaving the world and then it was made for someone who was coming into the world so it is really the whole cycle of life and when you think about it the gift of knitting is not that hat or that sweater it's the act of knitting itself that's the real gift because the act of knitting allowed me to stay rooted and not fall apart through that really dismal time when my dad was dying it allowed me to stay centered and, and strong because I was doing something positive and knitting is such a positive optimistic thing to be doing and knitting also took me out of grief it can take you out of grief and it can help you to embrace happiness which is another big part of our life so all through the book there's lots of essays in here uh, about the ups and downs of knitting there's some that are funny some that are heartfelt but all of them talk about I think the uh, message that the act of knitting is such a gift and we as knitters are so fortunate to be able to use that yarn and to use those needles and to create something beautiful to add to the world. Thank you so much.
welcome back. What I particularly love about Elvira's books are the quotes from all the historical literary figures and, and other famous people that the character Mrs Wicks includes in her replies. And there's also really beautiful paintings in yep. there too that are representative of, of what she's talking about. So you kind of, you enjoy reading the replies, it's very light-hearted, but at the same time you're kind of learning stuff. You learn a little bit, yeah. yeah. I did want to read out one of the replies, uh, or one of the letters and the reply. Um, this is something that's a lesson for all of us, of course. <laughs> and it says, Dear Mrs Wicks, help. I've been knitting for two years and I am embarrassed to admit that I have still not learned how to purl. It is as if my mind has decided I can't do it and, well, I just can't. Do you have any suggestions? Sincerely, Stuck in Seattle. And Mrs Wicks replies, Dear Stuck, every now and then I hear from a knitter with the exact same problem, pearlophobia. For some reason, while the need to knit is great, the fear of learning the other essential stitch in knitting, which is to purl, is so off-putting they give up and spend their knitting lives stuck in the garter stitch limbo. <laughs> this puts me in mind of Vincent van Gogh, who had a deep understanding of fighting one's own negativity. In the many letters Vincent wrote, he spoke of the struggles he faced both in his life and in his art. His was not an easy path, and yet his determination to learn and create gave him the strength to work through the many obstacles he, create, he encountered. We have a quote from Vincent himself, and he says, If you hear a voice within you say, you cannot paint, then by all means paint, and that voice will be silenced. So we're just inserting pearl there. Yes, that's right, or whatever it may be. So Mrs. Wicks goes on, you might be surprised to learn that, like many a knitter, Vincent kept a yarn stash. This box full of yarn is on display at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. There is no record of Vincent using his stash to knit any tea cozies, but we do know that he used the yarn to explore colour. He would wind different coloured strands together to see the effect created. Who could imagine that from a little red box of yarn such great inspiration was to come? I reckon that's where Cape Facet got his idea. Could be Cape Facet, and I was also reminded of Terry Malcolmson. Ah, yes. He did the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure who influenced who. <laughs> well, let's talk about your influence. My, How's your pearling my going? Influence and my, my pearling. Look, I did have the goal of being finished on this beautiful scarf by today, and I'm not here. The needles are still stuck in the scarf. This is shameful. It's very close. I did consider <laughs> postponing this episode as yes. one solution, and the other solution, I thought there are two ends to a ball of yarn, and I could have just got into the other end and cut it off a bit shorter, and then I would have been finished sooner. Yes. But I haven't done it. I'm persisting. Well, good for you. I'm persisting. Patience. Okay. Well, keep going. It's going to be finished very soon. It better be. <laughs> yep. That's my scarf. I want to quickly show you a little bit more of my Marie Wallen Samfrey. I've worked a bit more on the body. It's done in the flat. The pattern's written in the flat, but I've converted it to knit in the round. So there it is there. I've done that much of it. And I think it's very interesting to see how different designers work with colour. Because typically, if you take a colour class, you'll be told to make sure that you have high contrast between the background colours and the foreground motive colours so that you can really see it clearly. And that's what the traditional um, colour work stranded patterns you know, look like. Uh, but I think it's very interesting how Marie has done her colours. She's got a very low tonal contrast between foreground and background colours. So I've taken a photo of my knitting and I'm showing you here, and so it's the same section of the knitting, but one's in black and white and one's just in colour. And I, it really shows her sophistication because the pattern motif, so she changes the colours on the background and she changes the, the colours on the pattern motif. But the pattern motif is actually very large in this design. But because she's got a low tonal contrast between the colours of the foreground and the colours of the background, the effect isn't really strong or harsh, but it's actually really gentle and flowing. So it's quite subtle, even though it's a big pattern. If you change to high contrasting colours, it would have a completely different effect. So I think that's quite interesting. So I'm going to work on it a bit more and I'll talk about it again a bit more. But I've actually... <laughs> I came to this conclusion last night that I think I'm actually going to rip it out. You're concerned, aren't you, Dolph? <laughs> I'm not going to say too much, but I think I'm going to have to rip it out and redo it because my gauge is absolutely perfect with the recommended gauge and I'm doing it all right, but 
I don't like the way it looks on me and I think I'm going to have to add some shaping which is a real shame because I was planning to wear it at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival <laughs> where we're going <laughs> and I pr may not get it done by then but we are going to the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. Be half finished, yes. So um, come and see us in the podcaster lounge and um, it'd be cool to say hello to you. Yep, we're really pleased to be going there again, second time now. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Looking if you're going to, to meeting everyone. come and say hi. Yep. We want to thank all of our patrons for your ongoing financial support. We are very grateful for your, for your help because it really enables us to keep producing this show, which we love doing. We are independent and we don't receive money from sponsorship or advertising and it is very much a full-time job for me and more because it just takes that much time to be organising, preparing and producing a content-rich program every two weeks. So we're aiming to keep it at least this quality and keep trying to improve it. So if you enjoy watching our show and would like to help us do this, please become a patron. Thank you. It's time for some fresh air and some exercise. So we're taking you on a hike up Mount Snowdon. The route that we're going to take today is called the Miners Track. And it's called that because it is actually the path that the miners would take on their way to work in the Britannia copper mines on the mountain. We never actually get to the peak when we take this route because it's often icy on this last little bit, which is quite steep. And also in that area, there are still open um, mine shafts and we're concerned about our dog. He can, can be, be silly. Very silly, um, <laughs> sliding down there or one of us sliding down there, chasing after him. Yeah. Um, but it's really spectacular scenery. It's very beautiful. It is. So I've put a short um, little bit of footage together with you at, with accompanying music as I usually do. And when I edited it together, I played it to Andrew and he said, we can't use that music, it's too serious. And I said, oh, but I really want to because I really love it. So I thought, I'll just tell you a little bit about the music so maybe you can relate to it a bit better. So 28 long years ago, I was doing my piano performance degree and my very favourite composer of all time was the Russian composer Skriabin. And I loved Scriabin so deeply. I didn't think I could ever go out with anybody who didn't love Scriabin as deeply. Thank God I got over that obsession because I would never have met Andrew and yeah. married him. And I didn't even know Scriabin <laughs> at that time. <laughs> Unfair advantage. Yeah. Scriabin was also rather an obsessive character because he loved Chopin. In fact, he used to sleep with the whole works of Chopin underneath his pillow because he wanted to fuse his own psyche with the musical psyche of Chopin. He had some rather strong mystical beliefs, did Scriabin. Yeah. And, um, and you can actually hear Chopin's influence in his music, particularly in his early works. So it's very melodic and very romantic, but Scriabin's music has a few more dissonance in it, the harmonies, or perhaps more jazzier sounding chords. So my very favourite piece at that time was Scriabin Etude, Opus 8, Number 12, which I really had no business trying to play. Because my hand, I've got these long fingers, but I'm quite narrow across the, across the palm, so my span isn't very wide, and this piece has... A whole lot of rapid jumps and, and spans that are well over an octave. So it took hours and hours and hours and hours and hours to learn to play this piece. Now I performed it as my final show piece in my um, graduating recital. So after spending an hour of performing um, and all from memory, I still had this one show piece to go but I was exhausted as you are and this piece has got a lot of climaxes. It'll build up to a climax and then come down and build up again and come down. And there's quite a lot of dissonant chords right through that. But the very last chord and the final climax is a very open, um, sweet sounding major chord. So I got through the majority of this piece fairly well. And then, but on the final climax, on that final chord, I slipped and I created a dissonance. And that was so heartbreaking for me. That was so shameful and so disappointing <laughs> that I, I just didn't have... I've only just told Andrew about it. Yeah. 
been carrying this around with you. I've been you. carrying this around in my heart, and I'm telling you guys about it now. But anyway, it was it was very sad for me, but it is a totally stunning, dramatic piece of music, and I think it really um, represents the awe-inspiring, majestic, magical mountains that you have in um, Snowdonia. So I hope you enjoy the footage and you relate to the music. I'm Jochi Locatelli, and this is my sister Leti Locatelli, and I wanted to show you my newest design called Ranch Coat. Uh, I started planning this design back in 2016. I got this very special yarn from Madeline Tosh. They were working with these rustic uh, fibers, and they were making uh, ranch wools. Um, using fibers from local producers. So I, w I was dreaming of this coat uh, because I had so much yarn and I wanted to use it all and make something very large. And I uh, had this idea in my mind of a very big coat that I could bundle up in and wrap myself with. So uh, this is how I came about what I believe is my perfect uh, and most favorite coat. My favorite part of this design is that um, as you know, I love cables, so I wanted to include as, as much as many cables as I could. Uh, but in this design, uh, the cables start as a very um, tight interlocking design. They, they are smaller, but as you continue to work from the top down, 
these cables transform into medium-sized cables and then at the bottom they become even larger. But all the time you continue working the same column of cables. The cables is what become larger. To achieve this, I had to increase stitches in inside the cables so that we wouldn't have those empty spaces in between them. Um, this is a particular uh, construction that I have used uh, for the second time in this design. To work the ranch coat, you start here in the back, uh, at the back next seam, and uh, you do a provisional cast on, and you first work the, the neck band. And then you start a traditional raglan construction, but you will only be making a back and two sleeves. There are no fronts at the beginning of this sweater. You work that way until you reach the armpit, and when you reach this point, you pick up stitches along this line, and then you work the back and the fronts in one piece. Uh, that construction, what makes you uh, achieve is this draped front, this shape here, which I think is super flattering because it doesn't create a horizontal line. My problem is always my hips. I believe they are too wide. So um, I like to create designs that have these flowing and even hems. The second favorite thing about this design is of course the pockets. Um, I am obsessed with pockets. I have pockets everywhere. So uh, if I wanted to make the perfect coat, this coat had to have pockets. These pockets are really easy to make. You just put stitches on hold and you can cast on new stitches here. And then you sew the uh, pocket linings to the back of the sweater. I can't say how much I love this design. Um, it took me a year and a half to finish. I have just published it now, but I couldn't be prouder of it. And uh, so I hope you give it a try. And a very special thanks to my sister because today is super hot and she modeled this for us. Thanks. Thank you very much to Hohi and to Sister Liti for presenting the ranch coat to us today. Yeah. Coming from the Argentinian summer in the Southern Hemisphere. I loved hearing the kids playing in the background and the birds singing. Yeah. It's a beautiful contrast from the somewhat grey summer, that we're, grey winter that we're enjoying in yeah. uh, Frankfurt. Um, Hohi's garments always have an interesting construction and this is no exception. Yeah. I like the um, shaping that she's, she's achieved through the, the, the increases inside the cables. Yeah, that's cool. It's really cool and I like the curved hem on the coat. Um, it is constructed from the top down, as she said, so if you wanted to make it shorter, which I think would also be really groovy, that's quite easy to do. It would be a groovy swinging do. jacket, yeah. Yeah, it yeah, was cool. So thanks, Hohi. And now we're up to our interview with Jen and Jim Arnold Culliford. Yeah, their program, A Year of Techniques, is really clever. It takes knitters through some of the more advanced and more challenging knitting techniques using yeah. projects from some really great designers. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And the interview is actually quite hilarious because you've got the two of them together and they're very funny and witty. And Jen also talks a little bit about what the job of a tech editor involves. So I think you'll really enjoy the interview and they've yep. got a discount for our patrons. That's right. Gem and Jim are offering a discount on everything in their online store. This includes a, a year of techniques, um, but also the yarn kits that they have available to support that. And there's also a selection of other really good books there, I saw. Yeah, so that's so a fantastic that discount. Go and check that out. The details for that is on the Patreon page. That's right. But thank you very much for that. And now enjoy the interview it's a lot of fun and we'll see you in two weeks' time. Yep. Thanks for being with us today. Bye. Bye.
Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. Many of you will know my guest Jen Arnold Culliford through her recent project A Year of Techniques which she launched together with her husband Jim. So the idea is to sign up for the project and over the course of a year you'll receive a pattern and tutorial each month which allows you to learn a lot of new knitting techniques. But prior to this project Jen has been working as a technical editor for some of the top knitwear designers and Jen describes herself as a technical geek so over the years she's spoken so much about knitting with her husband that eventually he found that he was well qualified as a tech editor himself. So Jim left his job as a teacher and joined Jen to form their company Arnold Culliford Knitwear. So today you're going to get to meet them both but first I thought it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about what a technical editor actually does. So Jen, welcome to the podcast and thanks for your time. It's great to have you here. Oh, thank you very much for having me, Andrea. I have a feeling that technical editors could be unsung heroes in the knitting world and that many knitters may not know what they do or even that they exist as a job. So I thought let's start with a description of what a te technical editor does, um, what kinds of work, because I'm sure that there's a variety of work that they can do. And in your opinion, what kind of character traits does a, a good technical editor need to have? So, first of all, there's no um, formal training available for being a technical editor. So over the years, it's developed depending on who the client is and who you're working with and what their requirements are. Um, and that, they kind of break down into categories. So I've worked with a number of big yarn companies um, like Rowan or Stylecraft. And when you're working with them, it's essentially a, a can be a pattern writing job. So the designer sends through a sketch and a swatch and a specification with all the numbers for the sizing information for the first sample size. And the technical editor's job then is to write the full pattern instructions from that information and then also to grade that pattern, which means to size it up for the different sizes that that publication uses. So you might start with the sample size to be a UK size 10, um, and then you might size it right the way up to a 22 or, or whatever their specification requires. Um, then you might work for a magazine where you're provided with the full pattern to begin with and your job is a checking job and you make sure that the pattern instructions all make sense, that they're all in the house style for that publication and that um, all the bits are going to fit together properly. Um, you might also take a pattern in one size and write the instructions for the other sizes as well, but, but not always. It's a bit more of a mixture with a magazine. And then the third group of people that I've done most of my work with are independent knitwear designers who publish themselves uh, online, generally through Ravelry. Um, and when you work with an independent designer, it's more of a two-way process. Um, so you, you get sent the full pattern, quite often graded already, and my job then would be to read through the instructions, make sure that everything makes sense, look at areas which might need a bit more explanation, to check that all of the maths is correct and the pieces are going to come out the right size and fit together, and that there's a logical flow of information through the pattern. Um, and that's much more of a two-way process. You might flag up some issues and then come back and discuss them a bit. Uh, whereas with the other two cases, it's more of a, I take a pattern and I correct it and then I send it back again. Um, so there's a variety of character traits that you need to, to be able to do that well. Obviously, you need a strong background in, in maths to handle all the numbers of a pattern. Um, often you're working in up to 10 or 12 sizes, and so you've got to be able to handle all those numbers. But you also need to be able to imagine things in 3D and uh, problem solve if there are issues. And then w work on having a good relationship with the people you're working with, because most of your job involves telling people that they're wrong, or that they've made a mistake, <laughs> or that something's not good enough. <laughs> so yeah. you have to find ways to handle that empathetically so that you, you build a strong relationship. <laughs> yeah. So I know that you've worked with a lot of top designers, but um, for a designer who's just starting out, do you also have to guide them on 
perhaps construction techniques or, you know, it, this is, it might be a better way to do this in this instance, top down or bottom up or, or rewrite it. Do, do you do any of that kind of guiding? Um, I can do a little bit. Um, I would say the, the broadest part of the guidance I would give with a less experienced designer would be over making sure that their patterns are acce as accessible as they can be. Um, obviously, with publishing online, you're appealing to a really international audience and the pattern writing expectations can be quite different in different countries and so where in some parts of the world people would expect to be told to decrease 15 stitches evenly across a round in other parts of the world people would absolutely expect you to give a set of instructions on knit seven knit two together or, or whatever um, and so I would always encourage designers to ensure that their patterns are written in such a way that as many people as possible can access them because obviously then you're hopefully going to sell more copies um, of that design I have some Sometimes made suggestions around construction, but I generally would consider that to be a designer's kind of responsibility to decide on how to do something. I think the only exceptions that I can think of would be if you were doing something top down and taking it, taking the pattern into quite a complex pattern, whether it was a lace pattern or colour work, it's quite hard to increase into a pattern. It's much easier to establish a pattern and knit a big chunk of it and then decrease out of it. So I might make that suggestion, but but that's entirely up to the designer. <laughs> but you haven't always been a tech editor. So I'm no. really interested to hear what did you do before that and how did you transition into making knitting your business? So I first worked in uh, knitting as a profession back in 2008 when I got the job as technical editor on The Knitter magazine, which had just done its launch issue. Um, but yeah, as you say, that's absolutely not what I was doing before. My background is in chemistry. I did a PhD at university and then uh, trained to be a secondary science teacher. And I taught for a couple of years uh, before we then moved from just north of London. We moved to live here in the West Country in Froome and I had some time out when we moved and helped to renovate the house uh, and then got bored and decided I needed a new challenge so I retrained in horticulture and worked at Stourhead, the local National Trust property and ran my own gardening business for a while uh, but and about that same time I started to learn to knit that a lovely new knitting shop had opened on Catherine Hill in Froome and the owner was really supportive and friendly and she helped me um, and I, I took to knitting like a duck to water. I, I took on every new pattern that I could get my hands on and tried every new technique and was learning something new with every, every project I worked on and joined the local knitting group. And so I'd been knitting for a couple of years and I'd been doing my gardening business for a couple of years and actually the gardening business had got a bit repetitive and I wasn't finding it challenging anymore. So one of the ladies at my knitting group was Mary Henderson, the talented Fair Isle designer, and she'd had a few patterns published in Simply Knitting. And so she got wind of the fact that Future Publishing, who make Simply Knitting, were launching a new magazine aimed at more experienced knitters called The Knitter. And they were looking to recruit a technical editor. And so she talked about this to me at knitting one night and I was like aha yeah I could do that I could do that job <laughs> um, you know no background in in knitting beyond having been knitting for a couple of years and no background in publishing whatsoever um, and so it sort of it was at the back of my head but I didn't think a great deal more about it until Mary came back to me and said oh Jen here's the job description for that job I was talking to you about and I took it away and I had a look at it and um, as I read through the job description I said oh actually, hang on a minute, um, all these skills that they're asking for, I've, I've got all of them because of the different jobs I've done. And actually, I'm not sure how many people are going to have this actually quite peculiar mixture of skills because you've got to have a good technical um, knowledge of knitting, but you've also got to be very maths and problem solving, very comfortable working with fairly complex software like um, InDesign and Illustrator from Adobe. And, and yeah, and you have to be good at communicating and good at teaching people new things. So I could probably do this. And so I sat down with my father-in-law who had just retired from the Navy. And so he'd had a whole package of career change training quite recently. And he helped me to write a skills-led CV 
so that I could demonstrate really clearly to the team at Future Publishing that I could actually do this job, even though on, on paper or at first glance, it might not have sounded like I was the person for it. And, and I was lucky enough to get the job. I, uh, I succeeded. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so great that you had him to help you look at, the, um, look at it from a skills orientated rather than a, a qualification orientated yeah, yeah. way. That's excellent. And you have written that you've seen that you can see parallels between science and knitting. So tell us a little bit about that. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, when you write up a, a scientific experiment for a thesis or for a publication, you've got to write a set of instructions that allows somebody else to pick up those instructions and to work from them um, in such a way that they recreate exactly the same results that you've got. Um, and so that's, of course, just like a knitting pattern. That set of instructions should allow you to work through in a logical order, understand exactly what you need to do and recreate the same thing as the, the designer has intended. So, um, yeah, and it's a lot of thinking in 3D and obviously the maths and problem solving go with it as well. <laughs> And just another little point, because you actually um, design yourself, don't you? Yeah. So you have a bit of a mixture of being the um, creative person, but also the very technical um, scientific person. So how does that fit with you? Yeah, well, it doesn't fit. It didn't fit with me at all, to be honest. Um, I started designing because uh, once I'd been on the magazine for a while and I'd got my feet on the table and could work out how to do that job, um, I started to have the time to think a bit more about techniques and I started to wonder about, oh, I wonder if I put this technique together with that, what would happen? Would it work? Would it make a nice design? Um, and came up with the idea for my spiralling socks pattern and the knitter very kindly offered to publish it for me. Um, and so I was quite, I was very techniques led in the way that I was designing. And, and when you work on a magazine, sometimes they have a hole in an issue or um, there's some, you need a pattern at short notice. And so I started to put myself forward a little bit to, to do those small, small designs that the magazines required. Um, and now if you kind of fast forward a few years, I've obviously gone freelance. I left the magazine after two years and I have to concede now that I am, I've made 50 odd patterns. So I, there must be some element of creativity about me, even though I was rubbish <laughs> at drama and art at school. I was, I, I didn't see myself in that way at all. I saw myself very much as a math science geek. Um, but yeah, maybe creativity isn't quite as limited as I thought it was. It's not just about making a nice picture. <laughs> Yeah. Or, or having loads of ideas all the time. Actually, you can be creative just, you know, once in a while. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So actually, my next question is about creativity because um, and the vulnerability that you feel because often designers and creative makers, they can feel or they can experience a feeling of vulnerability every time they release their work to the public. So they might be working on a pattern and it unexpectedly becomes a huge hit. And then another design they're working on, they've put their heart and soul into it, but it's actually only going to get, or only gets a lukewarm response. So you, from your experience as a designer yourself and from working with a lot of other designers, how do designers and creative ma uh, makers uh, cope with this sometimes bouncy emotional ride? It's difficult. There's no two ways about it. Every time you release a pattern, you're putting a bit of yourself out there and you're basically asking the public to vote with their money or whatever on that pattern. Um, and when it does well, obviously it's brilliant. It's really self-fulfilling. It really um, makes you feel great. It's really exciting. And when it doesn't get picked up on quite as much, then you can take a bit of battering with it. Um, from my own point of view, the, the best way for me to kind of keep that in perspective is to plan when I'm going to publish things. So I don't put all my eggs in one basket with a pattern and not think about what's coming next. I try to think, well, this is just part of a plan and I've got a number of other things. So it's not all riding on this one, this one thing I'm putting out now. Um, having said that though, we're all human and on pattern release days, I'm absolutely useless. I'm so, so <laughs> terrible. I can't do, I can't do any work. I am totally distracted by whether people have favorited it on Ravelry or whether they've queued it. Even better, we like queuing things. Um, you know, how many people have clicked like on the Instagram picture? I mean, it's just, it's, it's awful. <laughs> but, but you know, that's what it's like. You put something out there and, and the feedback is important. 
nonsense, isn't that? <laughs> it is, it is. Although you try not to take it to heart or, or you try to keep the big picture in mind, it's definitely um, always there, isn't it? It yeah. is, yeah. Well, and, and even worse, if you're in a collection with other people and so lots of patterns are released at the same time as part of a collection, yeah, you, you don't want to be the person whose pattern's got the least favourites. <laughs> 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 oh dear I'm it's hilarious bothered, but I'm not it's bothered not, about yeah. being at the top but yeah just not right at the bottom please <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> Cool. Well, thanks for sharing. Okay, so um, your husband, Jim, is now going to join us. That's yep. very exciting. It's always fun to be able to talk to couples who are working together in business. So welcome, Jim. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you very much. And um, I'm really keen to hear the story about what drove you to join to give up your job and join Jen in the knitwear business and we all want to hear lots of juicy details because <laughs> it's interesting when you've got couples working together in business so we want to know who's the real boss behind the scenes <laughs> and <laughs> what are some of the joys and challenges of working together creating this business well my background is is very similar to Jen's in that it's science uh, and I was a teacher for for over a decade uh, we have a fairly <clears throat> complex family life uh, and actually my, my school life and my family life were, were really difficult to get the balance right um, and it reached a head where it was a choice between was I going to be the teacher I wanted to be or could I be the, the parent that I wanted to be um, and so it was a relatively simple decision when we were looking for what to do next for me for, when Jen said why don't you come and work with me uh, we laughed for a long time, and uh, when we finished laughing, we we actually realised that it was a, a sensible decision and and quite a simple one to make. Uh, my my background, obviously similar to Jen's, means I've got similar skills, but actually I'm not a complete novice when it comes to all things knitting. Uh, throughout Jen's time at the Knitter, she would rabbit on about all these brilliant new things she'd learned, and I'd try hard as I tried, I couldn't filter it all out, and so I had this this kind of stock in my head of, of, of latent knitting knowledge. Um, and it reached the point where I, I actually set up a pseudonymous email account and started sending letters into the knitter, uh, which everybody on the knitter, or so I thought, knew that it was uh, it was me doing it until somebody came in on maternity uh, cover and actually published one of my slightly rude emails as a letter in the magazine because they didn't realise it was from me. Um, so I, I picked that up and, and we'd also, in, in that time... Um, Jen had had to, to work on a, a magazine for Future that was going to be published uh, in the States where they took some of the back catalogue um, patterns and, and, and published them, but in a different yarn, not realising that when you change the yarn, everything changes about the sizing and tension and all sorts. So we had a fun week sitting at home, two computers, all day, every day, uh, resetting these patterns, uh, which was actually it was really good fun. And it was, it was kind of a, one of those things we realised actually can work pretty well together. Um, and so between my doing that and, and the rude letters, I also ended up writing a column um, for Simply Knitting called Knitting Ruined My Wife, which regaled the readers <laughs> with with stories of things like the, the night Jen woke me up and said, Jim, Jim, I can't sleep. I'm just too excited by tubular cast on. And he <laughs> I'm still too excited by the tubular cast on. <laughs> For goodness sake, it's just knitting, you know. But it's it, it, just knitting. <laughs> but you, you, you know, I, I, as I say, I picked these things up, and and it, it it became part of my my working knowledge. So that although there's a huge learning curve coming into actually doing it as a job, um, I'd got the basis uh, and the basics in place, uh, and really it was just a question of learning very very quickly uh, what I needed to do. So the way we divided up initially was that uh, we'd kind of share clients. I'd do some of the work, the kind of the simpler end of things, and Jen would check over my shoulder um, just to have a look over things. But then also I'd look at her her work just to see that there weren't anything, any little bits that she'd missed or uh, things that I thought, actually, that's not as clear as it could be because uh, I come at it from a, a much more... Um, beginner I suppose yeah. naive point of view yeah, yeah beginner yeah. I, I, I can knit I do knit but I'm not as, as accomplished as Jen is so actually thinking about it from from that perspective I think adds a little bit to to her work and to, to our work definitely um, yeah. which is has is, been a good thing as things have progressed though I've kind of 
moved a little bit out of, of editing and, and much more into the kind of the, the business functions uh, as our business has grown just because it's needed to happen. So now I have all the joys of the accounting, all the joys of the VAT return. You know, it's, it's um, again, it's another massive learning curve. But within that as well, you know, we, we've moved into into the video tutorials we'll talk about in a bit, maybe. Uh, and actually, I'm the person that does the editing. So again, it's it's a new challenge is learning new things. And that really, I think, is what drives both of us. Yeah, we both like learning new stuff a lot, don't we? Yeah. So, <laughs> so although kind of creatively, Jen's in, in charge I suppose actually, my voice is not silent within that. Oh, gosh, no, and, no. and if if there's something I think is is not right, then then we'll have a discussion about it. Yeah. Okay, that's great. And you have a really strong and vibrant Ravelry group, and um, where people are really interacting there. And your project, A Year of Techniques, has been a really strong success. So why don't you talk to us now about how that came into being, um, show us some of the patterns that are in the book and talk about some of the techniques that the knitters will learn through participating. It started out as, as us having a, a conversation. We had our Christmas dinner in, in January, as you do when things are busy, uh, and we had a couple of hours where we didn't have anything else to think about or worry about. So you kind of have a bit of almost dream time. Uh, we were talking about, well, what do we want to do in the next year? We worked on, on publications for other people. And we said, well, why, we could do a book ourselves. You know, we've got the, got the design contacts to do design for us. Yeah. But if we did that, what would it look like? And how would we put our mark on it to, to really make it stand out? Yeah, what would make it our book hmm. um, rather than just another book of patterns? And um, obviously, we've both got a background in education. We both like teaching. Um, and so to teach new techniques seemed like a fairly obvious hmm. jump, didn't it? Yeah. And then, and so I thought, well, okay, we need to make sure that the techniques go with the patterns. And I'd had this vague idea about doing a, a seasonal collection, you know, a spring collection, a summer collection, an autumn collection, a winter collection, with with things for different times of year, so you fit the technique to to kind of time of year. And that, through our discussions, just changed slightly, and it became a year of techniques where there's a a technique a month for a year. Uh, with a pattern that, that uses that technique and possibly would then build through the year to, to build up people's skills. Yeah. Uh, and that's really how it, it came about from there. We just we kept adding bits. Yeah. So we decided that we wanted to have both uh, the photo tutorials in the book, but also have video tutorials online as well. You know, again, as teachers, we're quite aware that people learn in different ways and people take in information differently. And so some people really love a video tutorial, whereas others would much rather just have the static text and photos. Um, but it was quite a nice way of bringing people in. So we teamed up with um, Kay and Anne at Mason Dixon Knitting, and they've been hosting our video tutorials as we've gone through the year. Um, but yeah, we also have this really vibrant knitting group on uh, Ravelry, which we launched back just before the Book of Haps was published last year. And we'd done a big knit along for the Book of Haps, which had been massively successful. And as that came to an end, people were really kind of saying, well, how, well what are we going to do next? What are we going to, what's going to keep us here? We really want to stay together chatting about our knitting. And, and I said, of course, you know, stay, chat about your knitting. Uh, but we also, we also then ran a few knit alongs through the back end of last year. We did one where you could do a project inspired by a picture. Um, we did one where you could knit something that you'd always wanted to make. But, but we really kept um, to, our our feeling is that the group should be as inclusive as possible that you should be able to make it work for the knit along in whatever way you want it's about joining in and trying something and taking part so there's never any compulsion to finish the project I'm um, I'm a serial knit alonger who doesn't always finish I've still got some picture this things on my needles I'm sure but but that's you know that it's meant to be fun isn't it it's not always about finishing it and so we took that and obviously everybody in our group has kind of come along with us in the most fantastic way and we're so grateful for that um so we thought obviously then a monthly knit along around the technique so you don't have to knit along with the pattern from a year of techniques so of course we love it when you do um any any pattern that uses the month's technique is welcome and so this kind of supportive community has really grown from that hasn't it yeah yeah and it's we've got you know amazing moderators who help out and it's, it's yeah. just 
it really has developed into a, a, a really thriving community. Well, show us some of the patterns that are in the book. So this was really hard to choose, OK? We've got 12 patterns in the book and we, we love all of them. It has been a bit like choosing amongst our children, yeah. hasn't it? <laughs> Which is your favourite? <laughs> so we love them all, but the ones we've picked out because we had something particular that we wanted to say about them. Um, starts off with uh, this. This is the Brambling Shawl by Bristol Ivy, uh, which was the second project um, in a year of techniques and it teaches in Tarsia. Now, I know that lots of knitters have um, a slightly wary relationship with Intarsia. Not everybody is uh, as accomplished as you are. <laughs> and it definitely is one of those techniques that, that can really put people off. Um, but I discovered that Bristol had done a pattern for the Book of Haps that used Intarsia. And actually the way that she was using Intarsia really inspired me to spread the message that um, Intarsia can be really manageable. Um, and the way that she does it is that it's always the same stitches that you're working in a particular colour. So when you reach the middle of the brambling shawl, you have got one, two, three, four different colours on a go at, at, in each row. But it's always the same stitches being worked in that colour. So you're not worrying about where the yarn's got to be on the next row, which I think is one of the things that's tricky at first when you try Intarsia. Um, and so instead, she she moves the colour blocks with series of increases and decreases. And that's how she creates these beautiful, beautiful blocks of colour. But it's really manageable. Yeah, that sounds great. I want to show you Alex the Mouse. Uh, Alex the Mouse is designed by Ella Austin. And the technique for this was the pinhole cast on, which is used for his nose and then you work outwards and also on his, on his feet. Um, for me, apart from the fact it just looks brilliant, uh, it really brought home from the projects that we could see from the other knitters, what we're trying to get them to do. Uh, there were many people who took this idea and, and knit it straight as is. Other people changed the colors. Other people said, oh, I like the pinhole cast on, but I'm going to make a different animal. So we had a whole menagerie of, of animals with pinhole cast-ons. Uh, and, and the thing that really I absolutely loved about this when we saw the, some of the finished objects from it was that people really put their personality into it and put their own spin on, on the mouse. So there were some people who had little skirts and, and little fair isle socks and all sorts of little additions to it that really... It took a, a, the idea and just, just absolutely ran with it. And that's what we'd really like people to do is to say, well, OK, I can do this technique now. I'm going to put it, I'm going to make it my own and, and mm. do it my own way. And, that's and, and really amazing. encouraged other people to do that yeah. as well. I think a lot of people saw some of the modifications people were making and thought, oh, gosh, yeah, I could do that too. And I, that's one of the things that I just love is that feeling that actually I, I could do that. I could try that. And I haven't done it before, but I'm going to give it a go. Yeah. And it's really that's that was amazing to see. Uh, next up is the Little Turn Blanket by Tin Can Knits, if you grab there. Uh, this was the project for August and it teaches the provisional cast on. So um, there were two different methods that we taught. We taught the crochet provisional cast on, but also Judy's magic cast on, which is normally used for the closed base of a tube, but it's actually a great provisional cast on as well. It's very versatile. And so you work the body of the blanket. And then when you come to the end, you knit on an edging. So you've been working the body this way and then you knit on an edging perpendicular. And knitting it on edgings was actually the project technique for June. So this was an opportunity to revise a technique that had been used earlier in the book. Um, and you then go back, obviously, and take out the provisional cast on and put in matching edging on the other end of the blanket. And it's very sweet. So this was... September's project. This is the Wood Warbler Cowl by Martina Bain, and it really builds on some of the other um, techniques that have come through the years. So it starts with a, a um, provisional cast on, and it's worked in garter stitch, and it's one of those ones that's deceptively clever. It's only it's only garter stitch, but you've got uh, increases and decreases to make the shaping, and then you can't see except for where the colour is, you can't see where it joins because the technique for this is a garter stitch graft down of gen holes, that down the line through here where the, the two colours of gradient, uh, shop or gradient meet. And if you've not come across shop or gradient yarns, they are a little bit different. They're really, really lovely to work with. Uh, and for me, this, again, this, this moving from one technique through to the next, if you didn't like doing provisional cast on for the little turn blanket, say, and didn't want to do that, you can still use it for, for this, and you've got all the instructions uh, within the book, which I think is, was part of our, our plan. And then uh, the last one I was going to show you is uh, Woolly Wormhead's Ruskia hat. 
which has worked sideways. So Woolly Wormhead is an amazing hat designer. And uh, you use, again, the provisional cast on another nice opportunity to revise that. And then you're working backwards and forwards between the brim and the crown on each row. And there's a slip stitch pattern. And then this hat teaches you to do short row shaping in garter stitch. So again, we provided a choice of tutorial. You could either use German short rows or the wrap and turn technique, both of which are great for garter stitch because they're very straightforward. And that's what creates the 3D shape of the hat. And then when you come to the end, you're obviously then going to graft in garter stitch the two ends of the project together. So it's been really nice to see people saying, you know, that wasn't something I really knew how to do before. And now that we've done it on a couple of projects in this, I feel really confident about attacking a project with with that technique in it. So do you have some of, like at the beginning of the year, do you have more simple projects and then some of those techniques that you've learned at the beginning of the year you might incorporate at the end of the year or are they all quite separate by themselves? Yeah, well, we started by commissioning the designers to do specific techniques. Um, and then when all their ideas came into us, we sat down and decided on the order that they needed to go in so that you weren't using something before it had been taught. Um, but I'd say that the, the difficulty level does vary a little bit within the year. There are projects that are eminently suitable for a confident beginner. And then there are more complicated ones. Alex the Mouse is a good example of one of the more complex projects where you need to have a certain amount of of confidence in in working in small diameters and things like that. Well it sounds like you've also had a lot of fun in collaboration with the other designers. Oh gosh yes we were absolutely delighted to be able to work with really our, our dream team of that you know these are the people whose designs I cast on when I want to you know knit myself something nice. <laughs> yeah. I can see that why it's a success. You've really got a lot of, both of you are teachers and very good at communicating and educating and that is, is coming through. And it looks really thoughtful, the, the, the way you've put it all together. So that's great. Yeah, well, and it continues to exist as well. It's not stopping just because we're, you know, we're into November now. The threads all stay open and people are still around chatting about those projects. So we have to finish, but I just want to ask a, a final question for both of you to answer. And this is a question I often ask people who have been either working in the knitting industry for a long time or really working at the core of it. And both of you have been technical editors and you also teach knitting and are educating knitting um, around that subject. And Jen, you're a designer yourself. So what, from that perspective... What challenges do you see the hand knitting industry as having and how would you like to see them addressed? That's a tricky one. <laughs> the, um, I think one of the biggest challenges at the moment is just the sheer, sheer volume of, of patterns and books being released. You know, we're at a really great moment. There's lots of amazingly innovative work being done. Uh, but I think it can get quite overwhelming for the knitting public to, to find the good stuff. And I think it's, um, it's sometimes hard to get your new ideas heard above the noise um, of the general pattern release cycle. Um, and it's also difficult, I think, for customers to know when they're buying a pattern, whether they're getting a pattern that's been um, produced carefully and has it had all the checks and things carried out on it and have has everybody who's taken part in helping to create that pattern been properly paid for all the work that's gone into it. And that's partly because the hand knitting industry has kind of grown out of hobby um, people doing it for a hobby and then putting up a pattern because people have asked for it. It's, it's, yeah, so it hasn't necessarily always come through a really professional route. So I think the biggest challenge really is to make sure that um, people who are doing really interesting stuff get their work out there and heard and, and noticed by people and that also people are, are looking for and asking for products that have been um, carefully produced I guess and so we're yeah we're working hard on <laughs> on producing those carefully produced products hopefully but um, and, and encouraging people to keep trying something new and to keep keep having a go at things which they're not sure whether or not they can do it but uh... <laughs> exactly like good uh, pattern writing skills are so essential for a beginner knitter. Yes, to help so you can them. so easily be put off otherwise, can't yeah, you? That's so true. Well, thank you so much to both of you for your time. It's, it's great to see you working together and, and make, being able to make a business out of it together and to be able to help so many people and, 
and have a vibrant, you know, following and group. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah, I know. We've really enjoyed talking to you. And I wish you all the best and further success. I'm sure you're going to have it. Thanks. Thanks very much. So we'll say goodbye to the audience now. Bye. 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 Bye.